Hey, good evening, everybody. Pastor Mike, His Grace Church, right here in beautiful San Antonio, Texas. Man, we're touching lives and we're changing hearts. I want to thank each and every one of you that are watching through one of our social media platforms for tuning in to Amplify tonight. Amplify is where we turn up the heat every Thursday night with practical teaching for everyday living. We hear it, we see it in the Word of God, and then we live it together as a community of believers. And I want to welcome each and every one of you here that are here, not online, but in person. Thanks for coming out, dealing with the traffic, the heat. Hallelujah. So let's get right into the Word of God tonight. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's, be, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our subject matter. Father, Heavenly Father, we just come before you tonight and with hearts open and minds eager to receive your wisdom as we seek your guidance and discernment from the Word of God. Lord, help us to understand the true nature of success and wealth through your eyes and not the world's eyes. Yes. Father, as we study tonight, may we find clarity in your word and draw closer to the principles that you have set before us. Grant us the humility to reflect on our own lives and even the courage to change where needed. And grant us the wisdom as well to align our goals with your will. And Father, I pray that our lesson tonight will be filled with grace and truth, and may we leave this lesson with a deeper understanding of how to live in accordance with your teachings. Father, we ask you to bless our time together. Let the Holy Spirit move among us. Amen. Lead us to a place of greater faith and devotion to you. Amen. I thank you tonight that, Father God, that I'll speak as an oracle of heaven revelation and understanding. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you speak through me, Amen. that my words will not be as with enticing words in men's wisdom, but in the demonstration and the power of the Holy Ghost. Yes. And so we thank you for this tonight. And Holy Spirit, we just ask you that, that, that you just work uh, on the hearts, that there's, there's receptive hearts, ears to hear, and eyes to see tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're back to the basics again, the good life. We're talking about the good life, part 25. It's hard to believe, 25 weeks. We're talking about, what are we talking about? Is learning to live the good life that God has promised us. And we found over, over the last several months, stewardship is important. God, God has a, um, a plan for us. And uh, he expects us to be good stewards of what he provides for us. And so we've been looking at some questions over the last couple of weeks about prosperity. And so this week, I'm going to continue answering some of those questions. And I think I've titled tonight's message, Chasing Dreams, Finding True Commitment in a World Obsessed with Success. We're, we're in a world that is driven, it is so success oriented. I can do this, I can do that. So let me begin by asking you this one simple question tonight. Are success and wealth signs of just being worldly? When we look at it from a, a Christian standpoint, are success and wealth signs of being worldly? And we're going to answer that question tonight, but let me state this. Success and wealth can indeed be signs of worldliness, but it doesn't always have to be the case. It doesn't always have to be the case. So when we, look at, when we look at the word worldly, so that we're all on the same page, let's define what it means tonight. Worldly refers to being overly concerned. Notice the word overly overly concerned with mere mater material <laughs> possessions, <laughs> physical pleasures, and the pursuit and values of the secular world rather than focusing on spiritual or eternal matters. So what it does is it involves prioritizing earthly desires over spiritual growth and godly living. Godly living. So let me give an example of someone who might be worldly by this definition. Let's, let's talk about Alex tonight. Alex uh, is highly successful in his career and over a process of time has accumulated significant wealth. However, his primary motivation for achieving success is not to provide for his family 
or even to help others, but to flaunt his status and amass luxury items only to impress his peers. Look at me. Look what I've done. Look how successful I am. You see, every decision Alex makes is driven by a desire for one thing. More money, more money, more money. Show me the money. More money, right? He wants more money, more power, and more recognition. And so because of that, he spends a large portion of his income on expensive cars, designer clothes, we'll say lavish parties. And despite having more than enough, he's consistently craving uh, more. And he's never satisfied with what he's had. He doesn't have any contentment. He's never content, contended, contentment. Content, there it is. I knew it was in the present tense. Content, he's never content, he's never satisfied. And what Alex does, he often envies others who appear to have more than him. You ever known people like that? To have more than him. And then what he does, he finds himself in relentless competition with himself to outdo them. I can, I can have more. I can have better. And in this scenario, then, Alex's actions and motivations exemplify this word worldliness. Because his focus then is on accumulating and showcasing stuff, Right? material wealth, and he's driven by envy, pride, and the need for validation from others rather than nurturing, nurturing his own spiritual life or contributing positively to the lives of those around him. So when we talk about being worldly, then what we do is we often refer to someone who is caught up in the desires of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Notice with me tonight, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. So in such cases, then a person might chase after success and riches, just to satisfy their worldly desires. Now, it's true that wealthy individuals face specific temptations that those with less might not experience, but this doesn't mean that only the rich are tempted by worldly things. We're all tempted by worldly things, aren't we? I mean, all the things that at some point look really good. And so those who are poor can be tempted by greed and covetedness as well as the rich. In fact, a person who lacks money might even be more tempted to desire more than what they, they already have. Often spending time uh, thinking about how to, to get and then spend money over those who already have it. Because they're, they're having to think how to get it. And so when we look at this, what's the key issue of all this? It's the heart. It's the heart. And the Bible gives us examples um, that, sh that as believers who manage to be prosperous while still maintaining a pure or good heart. And what these examples do is they show that God's people can have, definitely have financial success. They can have integrity, sincere motives, and still be a godly witness. Yes. See, success and wealth by themselves aren't necessarily signs of being worldly, just as poverty doesn't automatically mean someone is spiritual or humble. Right. And a person with little can just be as worldly as what we would consider a wealthy Christian. Excuse me. <coughs> Because when we get right down to it, the word, the word worldliness mm -hmm. is truly a matter of the heart. Right. And when someone chooses not to yield to God, but rather the desires of the flesh, the eyes, and 
pride of life, that's when worldliness takes root in their lives. And whether, whether rich or poor, the state of our heart and our relationship with God determine if we are worldly or not, not our success. Notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. I'm going to read through verse 17 tonight. Do not love this world nor the things that it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And verse 17, and this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So let me, let me say this. Let me, three worldly things that are not of the Father. Three worldly things that are not of the Father. Number one would be a craving for physical pleasure. And so what this does, this refers to the intense desire for bodily gratification and indulgence in pleasure that are often sinful or even excessive, such as we could say it gluttony. What is gluttony? Overeating, uh, sexual immorality, and substance abuse. And what happens is that these cravings then can lead us away from a focus uh, that we have on spiritual growth and godly living. How can too much eating lead me away? I understand sexual immorality. Well, God calls gluttony a sin, overeating. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We're, we're called to take care of this temple. And so it is a, for me, I don't know about you, it is a pleasure to eat. I enjoy food. I enjoy the taste of food. I enjoy quantities of food, but I have to maintain my girlish figure. <laughs> so I have to discipline myself on how I eat and what I eat. I have a, I have a, a body that can eat and, and it just stores everything I eat. And if I'm not careful, it'll store to the maximum. And so we are to take care of ourselves. We are to not crave these things. You see, it's not wrong to eat. We need to eat. Yeah. But it gets wrong is when we crave food. Yeah. We live for food. <laughs> Hallelujah. Pizza, yeah. pizza, pizza. What was it? The cookie monster. Cookie. Yeah. Cookie. Yeah. Chocolate. Our body have cravings. Just because it has a craving doesn't mean we have to supply it every time it craves something. How many times do you get up while you're watching TV at night just to go check on your refrigerator? Just to see if something has invaded into that holy space of coolness. Right? Well, just because you have a craving doesn't mean you have to satisfy it. And so we have to learn then to deny the cravings for physical pleasure. And that includes sexual immorality and even substance abuse. Then number two would be cravings for everything we see. Mm. Our eyes see a lot of good things, don't they? And what this does, this, this involves an insustainable desire for material possessions and wealth. And it urges, it's the urge to acquire more and more of what we see around us. Now, it's not wrong to have stuff. Where it gets wrong is it becomes driven by greed and envy. And these cravings then can distract us from our spiritual values and lead us to, to prioritize earthly treasures over our heavenly ones. So I'm not saying it's wrong to have stuff. What I am saying, it's wrong to continually crave things. Amen? 
Now the Bible says that, you know, in Mark chapter 11, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you have them. And I believe that God says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be one. I think God wants us to have good things. But the, the problem is, is that when we get to desiring them and craving them so much so that we make things happen because we're driven by the greed and envy. I got to have that because pastor got it. I got to have that because so-and-so got it. I got to have it because I just, I want it. It'll make me feel like I've attained or arrived. And the only thing you need to know is that God is the one that brings you to these places. And every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. And God wants you to have your desires. I, I mean, I had somebody over to my, at my house a, a while back, uh, a good friend. They hadn't been in, and they walked into my garage and they said, wow, wow. Now, to me, it's just a garage. But what they saw is stuff. Yeah. But what they really saw is, is the desires of my heart that had been met by my God. Right. And it didn't happen overnight. Some of those desires have been desires for 35, 40 years. And then God gave me a suddenly moment, whether it was given, whether it was purchased, however it came. Amen? Amen. And so the difference is, is that I'm not lusting after what somebody else has so I can have it in my garage. I'm thanking God because he saw my heart and gave me the desire of my heart. In 2013, for as long as I was born again, I had always wanted to go to Israel, but I never had been able to afford it. But it was always a secret desire. And God gave me an all-expense-paid trip to Israel. Wow. You see, He'll give you the desires of your heart. Yes. And I can tell you several other things that God has given me, um, you know, but I'm not moved or motivated by envy or greed. I'm content. I could be just as content without it as I am with it. I just, you know, it's like when a Harley Davidson go by, I just start drooling. <laughs> right? You all have your own stuff that you drool over. But I'm telling you, if you stay faithful to God, it's a desire of your heart. God will be faithful to deliver that to you at some point in your life. And then the number three is pride in our achievements and possessions that, that, that is something else uh, that's considered a worldly thing that's not of the Father. And so when we talk about pride in our achievements and possessions, and, you know, when I was younger, I'll be honest with you, I had a lot of pride. I was the epitome of pride. I grew up in such poverty that we didn't have anything. So when I got something, I wanted people to see that I got it. Because that, to me, was a sign that we arrived. When Pastor Kim and I got married, when Pastor Kim and I got married, we were driving. What year was that Camaro? That you, was your 70, 84? It was an 84. You remember that? 83 Camaro. Now, I, I always wanted a Camaro, 66, 65, 64, you know. But, and then, you know, but this Camaro... This Camaro, it was a nice looking Camaro, but it had been damaged. One of her family members took it out for a joyride one night and was driving backwards at a high rate of speed and ran into something. So where the, the nice tailpiece was, it, it had this little, <laughs> little light bulb thing. And so, you know, when we traded that car in, we traded that car in for a 1991 Toyota Camry, the old square Camry. And I thought, wow, this, is, this was really nice compared to what we were driving. But you see, shortly after that, I began, I got the, the, the new Camry style had come out with the rounded bodies built on the Lexus line. And I began to kind of lust after that a little bit, right? So after a couple of years, we decided maybe we could trade this in. And uh, we, we, found a, we found a used Camry. It was green, really nice. Had the old crank up windows. And uh, it was all manual and all this. And we, 
our credit score just wasn't good enough at that time. And I remember Pastor Kim was working at a mission, missionary organization and, and she was telling them about this car she was going to buy. And they just said, basically, you know what? That's kind of like too nice a car for you, given the implication that, hey, that's just kind of out of your league. And, you know, I, I, that kind of stuck a crawl with me. Three years later, I'm driving a brand new Camry. Same body style, same color, electric everything. God made a way. You see, I was trying to get this on my own, but God had a better plan. Three years later, you know, and so those words that those persons said that, you know, you'll never drive anything that nice. I was out to prove them wrong. You ever been like that? That's pride. That's arrogance. And so when I got that car, what I want to do, I want to go drive right by him. Hey. But I have to be careful because the pride and arrogance that comes from boasting about what we have and what we've accomplished is, becomes pride in our achievements and possessions. We want people to see we've arrived, don't we? just in our own natural self, but we have to be very careful that we don't move into, over into pride. And it can become an overemphasis on self-worth, and it can become status derived from material successes and personal, personal achievements if we're not careful. And so this pride then can prevent us from recognizing our dependence on God and giving Him the glory He deserves. Over the years, Pastor Kim and I have been able to rely on God to help us buy vehicles. And the reality of it is, over the last probably 20 years, I've only bought a very small handful of brand new cars. I personally have not driven a brand new car um, in probably... My, the last vehicle that I bought for myself that was brand new was in 2004. It was a pickup. I brought Pastor Kim a couple new cars that we leased, but we trust God for the deals. And there's nothing wrong with driving used vehicles that God gives you with low mileage. Yeah. And you don't have to pay all the high sales taxes and you don't have to pay all the high commission fees. And, you know, the last car we bought used had 7,000 miles on it, but it's highly discounted. And so just be careful when you attain possessions that you are attaining the possessions with the right motives of the heart. Not to show them off, not to act like you've arrived, not to be somebody you're not, but this is something that God has blessed you with. He either met a need, took care of your desire, or just opened a door to bless you. So when we look at these three examples, why are they not of the Father? Why is cravings for physical pleasure, cravings for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions not of the Father? Number one, we could say they're the nature of the world. And these cravings and prideful attitudes are rooted in the temporary and fleeting nature of the world system. And what they do is they focus on immediate gratification, self-centeredness, which, if we really look at it, are contrary to the eternal and selfless nature of God's kingdom. Number two, we could call them a distraction from God. And when we pursue these worldly desires, they can lead us away from our relationship with God. They can create a barrier between us and the love the Father has for us because our hearts become consumed with earthly concerns rather than spiritual ones. And then we have the eternal perspective. God calls us to focus on eternal values and we are to seek His will. And the things of this world, whether you know it or not, are passing away. But those things that are of God are eternal. And when we do the will of God, 
we will live forever as well. And by prioritizing God's will over worldly desires, what are we doing? We're, we are aligning ourselves with his eternal purpose, and out of that we're going to find true fulfillment. Let me give you an, an illustration of a worldly desire. Imagine a young man named Jake. Jake got a high-paying job and quickly became obsessed with buying the latest gadgets, designer clothes, flashy cars, boats, houses, you name it. And he spends his weekends partying, indulging in all kinds of physical pleasures and showing off his possessions to impress his friends. And despite his outward success, Jake feels a constant emptiness. He's incomplete on the inside. He always, he's always craving more, the next new gadget, the next big party. But really, nothing really seems to satisfy him for any length of time. And because of that, his relationships suffer, and he prioritizes his material desires over spending time with loved ones and friends. You know, and let me just say this, a, a, a really good waste of, of time, if you look at it, is the gaming industry. How many people are glued to their games consistently and consecutively throughout their day? How many people, the moment they get home from work, they get on their games and they stay on their games until they go to bed? at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning because they can't relinquish their competitiveness. They can't be content. And so they continually are wasting their time on their games instead of spending time building themselves up on their most holy faith and in their spiritual life. And so this is kind of an illustration with Jake. He's always onto the next gadget, the next party, the next game. Nothing seems to satisfy him for long. And he, he prioritizes his material desires over spending time with his friends and his loved ones. And after a while, what begins to happen, he, he begins to look down on others who don't have as much as he does because he's taking pride in his achievements and possessions. And one day, Jake meets his old friend, Sarah. And Sarah, she lives a simpler life. Sarah is content, she's happy, not because she has a lot, but because she focuses on her spiritual growth as well as helping others. Jake notices the peace and fulfillment in Sarah's life. It amazes him. And because it is so different from the life that he's living, it's so different from his own restless pursuit of worldly things that she could be content. And what happens is this encounter makes Jake realize that his cravings for physical pleasure, material possessions, and pride in his achievements have led him away from a meaningful and fulfilling life. So what, what begins to happen is he begins to understand that true satisfaction comes from seeking God's will and focusing on eternal values rather than temporary worldly desires. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8 kind of reiterates that. Verse 8 says, So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. If we have enough. We could, we could just do away with food and clothing, but if we have enough, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. But you, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness, and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. 
Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. Verse 8. So, if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. What does it mean to be content? That's a good question, right? When we look at the word contentment, it refers to a state of inner satisfaction and peace that comes from accepting our situation and then being grateful for what we have rather than constantly yearning for more or better circumstances. It's about finding joy and fulfillment in the present moment regardless of external conditions. It doesn't matter what's going on externally. You have joy in f and fulfillment in the present moment. Here are some key aspects of contentment. Number one. Acceptance. Contentment involves accepting life as it is. This means that we're embracing both the good and the challenging aspects which constantly, without constantly wishing for things to be different. You ever just woke up, I wish things were different. I wish I'd won the lottery last night. Right? Well, you're not content. Contentment is about recognizing that while we strive for improvement, our happiness isn't dependent on it. Our happiness isn't dependent about how much stuff we have or how much stuff we don't have. The second aspect of contentment would be gratitude. Being content is closely linked to gratitude. It means appreciating what you have, whether it's material possessions, relationships, or personal achievements. And then practicing gratitude helps shift our focus from what is lacking to what is abundant in our life. How many of you woke up today thinking about what you didn't have? Maybe what didn't get paid? Maybe were there shortages, right? Well, when we practice gratitude, it helps shift our focus from the lack in our life to what is abundant in our life our family, our relationship with God. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. Our jobs. Hallelujah. What are, what are you grateful for? Because when you focus on gratitude, again, it helps you shift from what is lacking to what is abundant in your life. Number three would be inner peace. Contentment brings a sense of inner peace and stability because you're not always striving. You're not always striving. You're not always striving for more. You're not always pushing for better. You're not in a race with yourself. You're at peace with yourself. It means not being easily swayed by external circumstances, successes, or failures. It's about maintaining a steady and calm mind, knowing that true happiness comes from within. True happiness doesn't come from Without, it comes from within. It comes from your relationship with God. The Bible says in Nehemiah 8 and verse 10 that the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we focus on the inward man, we're focusing on, we're, we're, we're focusing Godward. And so contentment can also bring joy. Number four, there's a detachment then from materialism. Contentment involves a detachment from the relentless pursuit of material possessions and wealth. Got to have more, got to have more. You're, you know, you're driven by the more. It's about understanding that while material goods can provide temporary satisfaction, they don't offer lasting fulfillment. Have you ever desired something? I tell you back when I was just getting out of college, man, TVs and VCRs. VCRs were just coming out. I mean, there was no flat screen. It was the big honking, you know, deep dish, right? Bigger 27-inch, whoo, that took up a whole tabletop, <laughs> right? Well, I wanted, I, I, like I said, I grew up in deep poverty. I never had anything. Every time we had a TV, it was black and white. The only time we got a color TV, my grandparents gave it to us, and my parents gave it away. They sewed it. And so, um, you know, 
I lusted, if I could use those words, desired greatly for a TV, and the VCR wasn't some little, I mean, it was. I desired it. I wanted it. And, and so there was a pursuit to get it. In fact, I got a credit card, and the first thing I did is I went and bought a TV and a VCR, because now I was sitting pretty, right? Yeah. Now, a lot of kids today don't understand TV, VCR. <laughs> but it's, again, it's about understanding that while material goods can provide temporary satisfaction, that's all it did, because once I got it, what was the first thing? Ooh, boy, I could get a bigger TV. I could get a bigger TV. Hallelujah. And so, you know, we have to be careful because material possessions don't offer lasting fulfillment, which leads us to point number five, spiritual fulfillment. For many, contentment is deeply connected with spiritual or religious beliefs. It's about finding purpose and meaning beyond the material world. And it often involves a sense of connection with a higher power, which is what we consider God, or a greater purpose. Let me give an example of contentment. Let's look at, a, let's look at Maria, all right? Maria lives a modest lifestyle. She doesn't have a high-paying job, a luxurious home. She doesn't even have all the latest gadgets. However... Maria wakes up every day with a smile. Every day with a smile. She enjoys her work. She loves spending time with her family and friends. It takes pleasure in, in just the simple activities like gardening, reading, walking in nature. And Maria practices gratitude daily, appreciating the small joys in her life. And one thing about Maria, she doesn't envy those who have more, nor does she feel inferior because she has less. She accepts her life as it is, and then what she does is she focuses on the positive aspects of her life. Through this, Maria finds inner peace through her faith, which helps her stay grounded and fulfilled. And then Maria's content, contentment doesn't mean that she lacks ambition or dreams for the future. Rather, it means she doesn't let the absence of certain things determine her happiness. Her joy comes from within, from her relationships, her faith, and her appreciation for the present moment. Her contentment originates from a combination of gratitude, acceptance, mindfulness, and spirituality. And by practicing gratitude, what happens is that we begin to appreciate the positive aspects of our life as Maria has, fostering then a sense of fulfillment. Acceptance helps us embrace our circumstances without constantly yearning for more. And so, when we practice what we call mindfulness, what, what this does, it keeps us focused on the present by reducing anxiety and regrets. And through all that, then our spirituality and faith provide a deeper sense of purpose and connection, helping us then to find peace and meaning then beyond material possessions. Isn't that what it's all about? Finding meaning beyond our possessions. And together, what happens is these elements create a foundation for true contentment, allowing us to experience lasting joy and inner peace. And according then back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, those who desire to be wealthy face several temptations, including the pursuit of foolish and harmful desires that can lead to financial ruin or even personal destruction. Because the love of money is highlighted here as the root of all kinds of evil. Not having money, the love of money. Causing people to engage in unethical behavior and materialism. And what this does, this craving for, for wealth, we'll say, then can lead us as individuals to stray from our faith, 
By doing so, it begins to weaken our relationship with God and results in numerous sorrows, such as stress, anxiety, strained relationships, and ultimately what happens in the pursuit of wealth, or we could say the pursuit of relent, the, the relentless pursuit of wealth, it often brings more harm than fulfillment. That's why God says, be satisfied, be content. See, the root of all evil, the root of all evil is the love of money. It's not money itself, but the love of money. This, distract, this distinction is important because money is a neutral tool that can be used for good and evil. And it's excessive desires and attachment. It's the, it's the excessive desire and attachment to money that leads to, again, various harmful behaviors and even moral compromises. Let's look at Sarah and John tonight as an example. See, Sarah uses her wealth to support charitable causes, help her community, and provide for her family needs. She sees money as a resource to be managed wisely and generously. Sarah's relationship with money is healthy, and it doesn't dominate her thoughts or her actions. You know, money can dominate your thoughts. You can lay in bed thinking about what you would buy if you were had a lot of money, right? Now, don't look at me in that tone of voice. You all done it. Hey, I do, I'm going to win the lottery tonight. If I win the lottery tonight, I'll tell you what I'm buying. But John, on the other hand, is obsessed with accumulating more wealth. He works excessively long hours, and by doing so, he neglects his family. He neglects his health. He engages in unethical business practices to maximize his profits, and he consistently and constantly envies those who have more than him. John love, John's love for money drives him to make decisions that harm himself and others. Now, imagine a garden with two trees. One tree represents money, and the other represents the love of money. Now, I had one of these at my wedding, a money tree. The money tree stands for Strong, the money tree stands strong and healthy, providing shade and fruit for those who tend it responsibly. And people use its resources to nourish themselves, to nourish others, and it also is, it, it contributes to a thriving garden. Then you have the other tree over here. We call it the love of money tree. However, it's, it, it's evasive and destructive. It spreads its roots into other areas of the garden, choking out other plants, depleting the soil of nutrients. And the gardener's obsession with this tree leads them to neglect the rest of the garden, resulting in an, an unhealthy, barren landscape. And in this illustration, the problem isn't the existence of the money tree but the gardener's obsession with the love of money tree. You see that? This love causes harm and neglects the true purpose of cultivating a balanced and fruitful garden. So, likewise then, the love of money, not money itself, is what leads to various evils and then personal destructions. That's why... We are called to flee the love of money and not really money itself. Again, money is a neutral tool that can be used for both good and bad purposes. And really, it's our attitude toward money that matters, doesn't it? The love of money refers to an excessive desire and attachment to wealth, which, which then often leads to unethical behaviors, moral uh, compromises and spiritual declines. And then what happens is this obsession then can distract us from our faith. It can cause us to neglect our relationships and make us prioritize material possessions over our spiritual well-being. Money first, God second. 
And that is not a good place to be. And by fleeing the love of money, we protect ourselves from these temptations. And what we do is we ensure that our actions and values remain aligned then with our faith and our principles that are aligned with God. It helps us to maintain a healthy perspective on wealth, viewing it as a resource to be managed wisely and generously rather than an end in itself. An end in itself. So, according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, what are we to flee from? We are to flee from the love of money and its associated temptation, and instead we're to pursue the virtues that align with a godly life. These virtues include righteousness, which means living morally upright and making ethical choices in all situations because we're in right standing with God. We are called to seek a godly life that reflects God's character through worship, prayer, and then obedience to His teachings found in His Word. Faith is essential as it involves trusting in God's promises and then relying on Him in all circumstances. I tell you, that's a hard thing to do, folks, to rely on God in all circumstances, especially if you have the power to make something happen. See, Love is another key virtue urging us to show compassion, kindness, and selfishness towards others. Perseverance then teaches us to endure challenges and remain steadfast in our faith. All the while, gentleness encourages a calm and kind demeanor, treating others with respect and humility. And what we're doing is by focusing on these virtues, we cultivate a character that mirrors God's love and righteousness, steering us away from the destructive desires linked to the love of money and then leading us towards a fulfilling, spiritually rich life. Amen. See? Again, we come back to Emma and Jake, two friends who both work at the same company. Emma chooses to live by the virtues outlined in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 11, while Jake is driven by the love of money. Emma prioritizes righteousness by always being honest in her dealings at work, even when it could be easier for her to cut corners. She leads a godly life by spending time in prayer and regularly attending church, seeking to grow in her relationship with God. Her faith is evident because she, she trusts God to provide for her needs, even when she faces financial challenges. Emma's Emma shows love by helping her colleagues whenever, whenever they are in need and volunteering at local charities. She perseveres through difficult projects at work, maintaining a positive attitude and never giving up. Her gentleness is apparent in her calm and respectful interactions with everyone. And regardless of their position in the company, she doesn't care high or low. She treats them all the same. Jake, in contrast, is constantly seeking ways to increase his wealth. He often manages unethical practices. He often engages in unethical practices such as practices such as exaggerating his accomplishment, accomplishments and then taking credit for others' work to gain promotions and bonuses. You know anybody like that? Huh? His life revolves around accumulating more money and possessions, neglecting his spiritual life and relationships. Jake's focus on wealth causes him stress and anxiety, and he struggles to find true satisfaction despite his already successful financial well-being. He's often impatient and harsh with others, especially if they stand in the ways of his goals. Now, over time, Emma's commitment to godly virtues earns her the respect and admiration of her colleagues and her superiors. She finds Joy and fulfillment in her work and personal life, rooted in her faith and in strong relationships. Jake, on the other hand, despite his financial gains, feels increasingly isolated and unhappy, burdened by the consequences of his own choices in life. And what this illustration does is it shows that pursuing righteousness, a godly life, Faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness, as instructed in 1 Timothy chapter 6, it leads to a more fulfilling and harmonious life in contrast to the emptiness and turmoil that comes from the love of money. So, 
do you think it's possible to follow after all these things while being wealthy? I believe it is. It's possible to follow after godly virtues while being wealthy. Wealth in itself is not inherently sinful or contrary to a godly life. Rather, it is the attitude towards wealth and how it is used that matters. And here are several reasons why one can be wealthy and still pursue righteousness, a godly life, faith, love, and perseverance and gentleness. Number one, stewardship. Wealth can, be view, wealth can be viewed as a resource entrusted by God to be managed wisely. A resource. A wealthy person can use the resources to support charitable causes, help those in need, and even invest in their community. And what this does, this aligns with the biblical principles of stewardship where one uses their blessings to bless others. Number two, righteousness and integrity. A wealthy individual can conduct their business and personal affairs with honesty and integrity, earn, ensuring that their wealth is accumulated and used in ways that honor God and reflect his ethical standards. Number three, godly life. Wealth does not have to distract from a spiritual life. Many wealthy individuals prioritize their relationship with God by spending time in prayer, worship, and in community service. They recognize that their wealth is temporary and that their spiritual well-being is eternal. Number four, faith. Wealth can be a platform for demonstrating your faith. Trust in God to guide decisions and how to use your wealth and relying then on Him rather than the wealth itself shows deep faith. It also involves recognizing that true security comes from God and just not material riches. Number five, wealth would be love. Wealth provides opportunities to show love in significant ways. Wealthy individuals can fund projects that improve the lives of others, support missions and ministries, and offer generous support to family and friends. And this reflects the biblical call to love one another. Number six, perseverance. Wealth does not exempt individuals from life's challenges. Wealthy people can still face personal health and relational trials. And persevering through these challenges with faith and reliance on God demonstrates a godly character. And number seven, gentleness. A person can maintain a humble and gentle demeanor regardless of their financial status. Wealthy individuals can choose to treat everyone with respect and kindness, fostering positive relationships and being a witness for God's love. Being wealthy and following godly virtues are not mutually exclusive. You see, the key lies in this one point, in the heart's attitude towards wealth and the intentional pursuit of a life that honors God. See, I believe that wealth can be a tool for significant good when managed with a heart aligned with God's principles. So let me give you a call to action tonight. A call to action. As we reflect back on tonight's lesson, Let's examine our hearts and our motives. What, what, what of our motivations? Whether we are wealthy or not, the true measure of our lives lie in our relationship with God and our pursuit of His virtues. So I encourage you, let us then commit to fleeing the love of money and instead strive for righteousness, gentleness, faith, perseverance, and gentleness. Let us seek ways to use our resources, our time, and our talents to honor God and then to bless others ultimately. Because remember this, true contentment and fulfillment come not from material possessions, but from living a life aligned with God's will. 
So, to answer the question we started with, success and wealth can indeed be signs of worldliness, but they don't have to be. It's the love of money, not money itself, that leads to spiritual downfall. And by focusing on virtues such as righteousness, faith, love, we can lead fulfilling lives that honor God, regardless of our financial status. And then through stewardship, integrity, and a heart aligned with God's principles, it is possible for us both to be wealthy and godly. Amen. Amen. I'd rather be poor. I, I mean, I'd rather be wealthy and godly than poor and godly. I can do a lot more for the kingdom if I have than if I have not. Yes. So let's strive to use our blessings wisely, finding joy and purpose in our faith. In our faith and then in serving others ensuring that our lives reflect the eternal values of God's kingdom. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts tonight, thanking you for the wisdom and insight that we've gained through your word. As we ponder the relationship between success, wealth, and worldliness, help us to keep our hearts pure and our motives aligned with your will. Guide us to flee from the love of money and to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness as we follow after you. Yes. Lord, we ask for your strength to live out these virtues in our daily lives, regardless of our financial status. Yes. Teach us to be good stewards of the resources you have entrusted to us, using them to bless others and to further your kingdom. Help us find a true commitment and joy in our relationship with you. And not, in a, and not in the fleeting pleasures of this world. We pray all this tonight. That your Holy Spirit continue to work within us. Transforming our hearts and minds to reflect your love and righteousness. And as we leave this place tonight, let us carry your light into the world, being examples of your grace and truth in all that we do. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you. I know each and everybody here has accepted Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior, but maybe you're watching us through one of our social media platforms and you've been Maybe you've been touched by tonight's message and feel stirring in your heart to know God more intimately. I, I would like to invite you to consider accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this evening. This decision is the most important one that you can make as it opens a door uh, to a relationship with God through the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. Tonight, if you're ready to begin this journey, please join me in this prayer of acceptance as we pray together out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn my, from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for this gift of salvation and for the promise of eternal life. Now help me to live a life that is pleasing to you and guide me as I grow in my faith. Father, thank you for your love grace and mercy in Jesus name now if you prayed that prayer for the very first time I want to welcome you to the kingdom of God several things that it's important that you take some steps to do number one find yourself a good Bible believing church we believe that if um, you're in the San Antonio area his grace church is such a place we're, we're located in the far west part of San Antonio in the uh, 151 410 corridor inside Loop 410 just off of Claybor Road on Alamo Downs Parkway, 6995. Man, come check us out. We're a smaller group of believers where everyone can know your name. It's a great place to hook up and, 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 and to gain a family.
man, we just not only come to church, but we hang out, we eat, we do things together, we socialize. So if you're looking for a group of people that love to hang out and, and be together, and, and come check us out, man. We're touching lives and we're changing hearts. It's also a good place to develop and grow spiritually. If um, you haven't been to our website, I encourage you to check out our website as well at www.hgcchurch.com or hgcchurch.church and check out our digital resources page under resources and you're going to find a series right there called The New Birth. It's a short series that Pastor Kim and I put together, about 10 videos long, five to seven minutes, and all it does is give you just a brief synopsis of exactly what's happened. It just helps you to understand what's happening to you right now, and that's Jesus is introducing himself to you in this moment of time. I also encourage you, as well as I encourage everybody else, to come check us out Sunday morning for our Sunday morning worship celebration beginning at 1030 Central Standard Time right here uh, on campus, man. We're going to kick up the jams. We're going to rock the house for Jesus. We're going to get our praise on. I'll tell you, we're going to have a good time in God. It's our connection point where we just come for a few moments and we magnify God. We focus on God and, and then uh, we go into the Word of God for our instruction. And, and this week I'm going to be talking, uh, talking to you about how the just, it's a commandment, shall live by faith. So join us here this Sunday morning, beginning at 10.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. The best way to be here is on campus. That's where, that's where it's happening. But if you can't be with us on campus, check out our social media platforms where we live stream Facebook through our YouTube channel. And then we're also on um, uh, Rumble as well. Thank you very much. Rumble. We're on. And there's a lot of rumbling going on tonight. Uh, uh, Rumble to, uh, as well. So we also are on X, which is formerly Twitter. We do postings there. And if you haven't had the opportunity, we put out a new blog this week, man. Check out our new blog. It's out there on Facebook. It's on our website as well at www.hgc.church. So, man, I tell you what, Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week. And our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. I'm Pastor Michael Pilmore. This is His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitation where miracles are still happening today. I'll see you right back here real soon for our next service.